Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to The Filmmaker's Life. Uh, this is an interview series that I do. My name is Joanne Butcher. I'm a business coach, and I work with filmmakers to help them raise money to get their films made. And so I started this interview series to interview filmmakers who are, are a bit further along. They've made um, at least one feature film, although in Kareem's case, he's made many feature films. And um, the goal is to inspire filmmakers who are yet to make their first features um, with, with doing so. So welcome everybody. And um, welcome, Kareem. Um, we were just talking about how how long we've known each other. It was actually even longer than I thought that we had known each other. So um, that's really great. Um, so when we do these interviews, Kareem, I don't start with a bio because I'm right. actually going to start from the very beginning. And my favorite question is my first question that I like to ask which is, when did you know, when did you first know that you were a filmmaker? Ah, that's a good question. So I, I'm I'm from the Bahamas. I'm originally from the Bahamas. I'm in LA at the moment um, uh, for an assignment. Uh, I've always been in love with storytelling. I, I, I grew up a lot around my maternal, my paternal grandmother who had a great love of movies. And movies were was sort of my entry into understanding the world around me. And so I thought that they the ability to tell a story and to capture the audience an audience the way that I was captured uh, was a very powerful um, a very powerful tool. And so I grew up in a very small town in Caribbean island and and I told people I wanted to be a, a filmmaker, which was uh, a bit not so <laughs> given <laughs> the, the environment in the late 90s and uh, my, my obviously I had really great parents and and you know they wanted to support my dreams and so at 17 years old they shipped me off to Miami and I embarked on this career on being a filmmaker and I went to film school and I, I didn't have a language of cinema at all like I, I didn't know who the the great directors were all I knew is that I loved movies and I just wasn't as well versed as many of my counterparts. And mm -hmm. I always tell the story the first day of the, the head of departments said, he's like, it was a room full of film students. And he said, um, by the end of the semester, 30% uh, of you would leave. Mm -hmm. And after that, half of you would drop out. And at the end of the day, only five to seven of you guys will ever work in the film industry. And I just assume <laughs> that it would be the boy from the islands who didn't have this big language of cinema, whose favorite director was Steven Spielberg and so commercial. And I, and, and, you know, but I had made in my mind that I was determined to, to see it through. And I think that's all you can really do as a filmmaker is, is to see it through. Cause it's really, it's, it, <laughs> It really takes time and um, persistence. Which uh, film school did you go to? I went to, uh, it was called International Fine Arts Uni College oh, at the time, but yes, it's called the University of Art and Design now, Miami oh, International really? University of Art and Design. So I, it was a tiny, tiny school. Oh, yeah. actually, yes, because a friend of mine uh, from back then, from those days that we're talking about, uh, is the person in charge of However, it is that, uh, that that a school becomes a university and a, a you know that kind of thing. And I just realized, yes, they they've gone through that process. Um, so uh, it, it's interesting for a Caribbean filmmaker coming from a small island, coming into a pretty big city of Miami. Um, how did it feel to be amongst all those American students who probably had about a hundred times more confidence than you did? Yeah, you know, I think youth is very, uh, <laughs> you could you could find very a lot of strength and like a naivety, not even naivety, I should say. And it's always great to have a naivety um, in anything you do, because I think naivety like brings courage because <laughs> you just don't, you, you can't not thinking of like, you know, possible things that, you know, 
that could deter you. Um, and so I always try to keep na my naivety about anything. And so I just kept a na naivety and I was like, okay, I just have to put one foot in step for an another and that can lead to something like you, um, you know, like this is going to be the worst thing I ever do. And the next time it's going to be better. Okay. And the next time will be better. And the next time will be better. And so I just had that mindset that I was open to making mistakes. I wasn't trying to set out to make mistakes, but if I made a mistake, it would be okay. And I just had to keep moving. So what was the first thing that you did after you graduated? So I moved back to the Bahamas and I uh, I moved back to the Bahamas and I, I felt that um, that I wanted to tell stories that were really important to me. And so I met a filmmaker by the name of Maria Govan and she was working on a, um, on a documentary called Where I'm From. Um, so I have a documentary background as well. Mm -hmm. And Where I'm From, uh, we worked on it for two years. She was working on it for three years before that. And it followed three very different people living with HIV at the time. One was uh, a mother that was eight months pregnant that was crack addicted. And one was a privileged um, uh, a white man uh, who's become a really good friend who had been diagnosed in 1981 and and he's still with us and the wow. other character was uh was a was a black gay man who since has 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 left us he i think he was a victim of a hate crime later on in the last decade or two decades ago and uh yeah and so that that film really changed a lot of stuff for me like in terms of have, doing a documentary and being in a, in a totally different world than i was accustomed to and that kind of shaped who I would become as a narrative filmmaker. Um, uh, and also, ha also having dual careers as a narrative and doc filmmaker. Um, and so I made a documentary after that, that was- I, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to say, so that that's so interesting because because your work so often looks at those topics that you were talking about that were in that documentary, right? So LGBT issues, oh. racism, hate, um, and about what being where you're from, and so so would the did that film introduce those themes to you, or did it just show it to you in a different way, so you knew, realized you could tell those stories? It it did, like it you know, it opened my eyes up to uh, you know the uh, the cruelty of the world and mm -hmm. how people are trying to make it, and how people find joy in in dire circumstances because people do find joy in those moments mm -hmm. and uh it did inform like you know you know in your 20s and 30s you you really want to make work but for me i really wanted to make work that that kind of that i felt had that can have an impact and shaping like how my community see itself and how the world saw my community Mm, very really good and um so when did you find yourself making your first feature film and how did that so my happen? first feature yeah so my first feature was a film called children of god um and uh so it, it it's a film about homophobia um about two guys that kind of meet at this crossroads um i had made a short film prior to that and that short film um had went to a lot of festivals and um, I had sold it to um, I sold it to a company in Germany and another country, and I sold it to Viacom in the U.S. and I had sold it to Frameline in San Francisco uh -huh. for educational purposes. Uh -huh. And so it was it was a film that had returned money. Like I don't know wow. how shorts do well these days. That's, no, I um, mean I'm, I always tell people you know you don't make money on shorts, but if you can can make some money so you actually made back more than you spent on your film i did i did because i had a broadcast I, I we also got a broadcast licensing deal for it yes. and then after that like we had we had like it went to colleges and it did a, it did a, a big educational even though it's a narrative right and so i used that as leverage to raise money um and unfortunately like I, we're talking American filmmakers, I, I think, and Caribbean filmmakers, I think. And so sometimes the onus is on us is to go out and, and find the capital for mm -hmm. our films. And so I, uh, and in naivety, I, I, I really felt like I deserved to tell 
a feature. Um, and, and so I went out and I put together a business plan. Um, and I went out and I found um and I found investors um to by selling shares and uh and and in the film and we made we made children of God and yeah yeah and it was and it was a lovely it was a lovely film that we're very proud of we we ended up having a broadcast deal with Showtime for it which was really nice That's and amazing yeah yeah so did that film also make its money back it did not it okay. did not and and it and and that and that is that was a very so I'll tell you a, a thing about this, right? So I, it could have made his money back. I, I, it, it, it did, it, it did sell to twenty eight countries around the world. Um, I did have a sales agent, and they sold it. And but when I got my my sales receipts back, I was owing money, and so. Uh-huh. <laughs> Right. So uh, I I don't think I need to say any more about right. that. Like we can just like figure it out from there. One, one question um, I do want to ask about that though is, uh, what year was Children of God? It came out in 2011, but I had sold it. It, it premiered in 2010. Yeah. So when you because you have so many films now that you've made, mm-hmm. are you still seeing? income from children of god from all those years ago in 2011 does so, the deal still so, stand do you you know are you seeing that pattern because because uh, one of my one of my friends right now is seeing more money on a 1998 film that he that he made than he's ever seen before <laughs> so it's interesting but but uh but children of god i in 2020 i i got my right i i uh-huh. It belongs to me now, yeah. so I was able to see this discrepancy, and um, and I was able to take back my movie. So we are like, <laughs> we are, um, we are. I, I, well, I moved to LA and all that stuff, so we're we're looking to um, to relaunch it with 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 people that we we think that are the best partners for it. Right, yeah. great, great, great. Yes, and I'm, I'm so excited these days about a- what's happening with Avard right now. That yeah. I'm oh, always interested. So um, the first one of your features that that, that I saw was uh, Cargo. How yeah. far along was it um, till you got to make Cargo? So Cargo was my third feature. Okay. Uh, my second feature was a family movie called Windjammers. And when Jammers was a little bit separate because it was a work for hire. Mm. Um, and that came like the following year after Children of God. So they both were released to the public during the same year. Um, and that was a different experience because I didn't, I wasn't involved in the fundraising. And so uh, the road to cargo between well, actually, cargo. When, since, since you talked about Winter, I'm sorry, but how was it that you got hired to direct a movie? How did that happen? That's a so the, the director um, had met me um, as a Bahamian filmmaker. He had seen, he had become involved and in, he's become a friend. He's a friend. And uh, he had, so, but how we met is that he had seen that I was making films in the bomb. He had seen the films and he was like, I'd like you to come aboard this film. And, um, and I did. And that's how it happened. And, and now we're really good friends. Um, uh-huh. But that's uh-huh. how it started. It's, it's from my previous work. I led to this work and right yeah that, I just feel as though that must have just been very exciting to get to be hired to make a film that was a Bahamian film and I yeah. I, I see a lot of water in your films which seems obvious to me given no. the Bahamian, but Wind Jam yeah. is particularly a water watery film yeah and I hate it <laughs> I hate shooting <laughs> in the water yeah. <laughs> I do it's it's very painful it's a lot of work yeah well you know I was living in the Caribbean so like (laughs) hey you know it's great to be in it's not great to work in right (laughs) right right. um uh, I think people don't realize that even though it's warm it's cold when you're in the water and you're working in the water say it's cold (laughs) exactly exactly so um, that that must have been great, though, to get that experience of working on Windjammers before you went to making your own movie, Cargo. Yeah. How, 
one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was great. I mean, and there was a break between obviously wind jams and cargo. Um, you know, Children of God went to a lot of festivals. Mm. Um and, and that lasted a very long time. And then, you know, I decided that I wanted to make art films. So I made art films for a few years, like that went to museums and I was oh. in a national exhibit and 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 so I made art films and then I edited a lot of films for people. Like so I edited documentaries and I made a short film called Passage that's online. Um and I so I wanted to return back to the roots of making short film to 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 sort of like do a litmus a litmus test on on uh on an idea and I was fortunate that the Commonwealth Foundation had a development scheme at that time to support films and um and Cargo had a lot of success on the film festival circuit as well um it ended up you know airing on PBS and a couple of public stations around the world um, it's online if you want to check it out. It was and and that short film was about a bunch of uh, a, a group of migrants on a on a ship waiting going trying to get to America, mm -hmm. um, and so and so that was um, that was a film and and that was a, a precursor to to Cargo, which we made three years later. Yeah, it, uh, so I haven't actually seen Passage. So Passage kind of tells the story from the perspective of the people on the ship, but in Cargo, we get a very different perspective. Um, yeah. how, how did you come up with your the, the character, the main character in Cargo? How did you land on this character? Yeah, so it's interesting. So Car Cargo and Passage are two different characters, right? So Passage, is told through uh, the migrant itself and so uh, you know i was in a um i was in a, a writer's development lab and i wanted to tell this action movie and i think i would my my mentor in that lab it was in trinidad actually and it was uh i think it was fina torres uh, who was a venezuelan filmmaker and uh she's like why would you want to do this she's like what personally connects you to the story huh. and so I had to really really think about it you know like sometimes when we make our films especially when we're making it independently and, and we have to go out and raise money and um you know obviously there's many different ways to to make your film happen um but for me I had to like really believe in it because it it was it's 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 a two-year process right and you have to meet a lot of people and you have to be excited every time and authentic and uh and and I thought about it and and I and I I wasn't interested I was interested in telling this genre from a different perspective um and I went back to a first memory that I had of, of, a, of, of a group of migrants that had um refugees that had washed up on shore and they were locked in a hole by by mm -hmm. a by a by a sailor and I and and I and I just was like, okay, how do, how can I enter this story from a new way? And so, so, so cargo is a story of, of a of a fisherman that becomes a human smuggler to pay off a debt. Um, and I thought that was an interesting way of of telling it that wasn't that hadn't that wasn't the norm, you know. And it's a very hard, it's a very challenging thing for an audience to to for the protagonist to be. A person that may be irredeemable in someone's eyes, but a character is never irredeemable in my eye ever. Um, so it, it's a challenge, and I was I was willing to to take that leap. I I I just want to say um, for anybody who's interested in screenwriting, I really highly recommend that you watch Cargo. Um, Cargo seems to me when you talk about an irredeemable character. Um, um, he, to me, he, he is the closest to a Shakespearean anti-hero that I've seen in contemporary filmmaking. Uh -huh. And I, I, I'm a huge Shakespeare fan, so, um, but he, uh, he is so flawed and he's so 
sort of bound on his own destruction, you know, and um, uh, he, it seems to me that he really rises to tragic proportions, you know, as a character. Um, and I, I think about the film a lot. I really do. I think about it a lot. I talk about it a lot. I tell people about it. Um, Thank you. But I think that uh, I'm sure it wasn't a huge budget film, you know. No, we we were like 1.2 thereabouts. Okay, but yeah. um, but it's uh, you know it does to me what not that one I don't want to say 1.2 is you know that low budget, but it's it's so much more about character than about anything else, you know. Yeah. And um, and then being able to deal with the social justice issue of um, human smuggling uh, is, is also really great that he's able to do that. But to me, it's his character that's the most powerful thing about a movie. And I feel as though for filmmakers, it doesn't matter what money you have or you don't have, you can always be writing character, you know, yeah. Yeah. fundamentally what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, like making a film in the Bahamas, that seems like a, a really huge budget. But like when you factor having to bring everybody in and putting them up, and then having an actor that's on a TV show and all that stuff, you know, that balloons that, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of water. <laughs> there's a lot of water, it's, and it's hard. A lot of and people are getting sick. And, <laughs> a, lot yeah. a lot of water. So, how did you get uh, your actor? So, you know, I was like, I watched a lot of TV and I watched a lot of British TV. Uh, you mean my, my, my lead actor? So yes. I was, I was, like every actor in there that I picked. So I was in, at the Trinidad Film Festival one year in 2014, and I was sharing a, a, a bus with Jimmy Jean Louis and Sky Nicole Gray, who are two characters in the movie. And I was like, I'm going to make a movie and I'm going to put you two in it. <laughs> that was that was that was it and so when I, I call them up and I was like like three or four years later I was like okay we're ready to go so Warren um was interesting because I had been watching a show called Luther and Did, uh I mean wait everybody didn't everybody watch Luther I, I assume everybody watched. <laughs> yeah yeah if you didn't watch Luther I, I really don't know what to say but it, it's funny because we do have this sort of love of British television I wish, you know, and, exactly uh <laughs> i've i've watched luther by myself and with my dad <laughs> and with, <laughs> and with luther, you know yes yeah, so yeah sorry you were watching luther i was watching luther and i saw warren and 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 i was like wow this guy is is great and he has a lot of sensitivity and i did see another he was in another show called i think it was accused Ah, uh -huh. and um, and it was like a, you know, and he was with in the show with um, he was starring with Naomi Harris, and mm -hmm. and he played an abuser, and he had such sensitivity in that role. I would reach out to his agent, and he had read the script, and he was like, "I'm doing it," and that's how that happened, and it happened very quickly, and uh, and about agent, and Jessica um, Genius was his agent. Uh, uh, what's the word? Did did his agent was his agent happy for him to do the movie? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, like in filmmaking, you have a lot of amnesia <laughs> about the, about how hard things was. But I don't I don't remember that being very difficult. I remember uh, that being very easy. Uh -huh. um, it was a British agent, and they were they were absolutely lovely people. Uh -huh. Great, yeah. great. They're absolutely lovely, and. Um, and uh, and and Jessica Genius, who's a, who's a, who's you know the heartbeat of the movie, uh, she was the recommendation from um, Jimmy John Louis. She's mm -hmm. a Haitian actress that are, mm -hmm. that's doing very good things. Um, she had a film at Cannes last year that's done well that Francis Ford Coppola executive produced. And oh. so yeah, she's wonderful, wonderful person and a wonderful artist. So um, it sounds also as though, because I've been to the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival many times. That's where I saw Cargo. And um, I've, I also have had great 
uh, car rides back and forth from the theater to the hotel with great people. So is it sounds as though that's a good way to meet actors. <laughs> I mean, festivals are really important, like the most, um, the really lasting friendships and working friendships and connections I've made have been through festivals, have been through like going to panels and following up with someone, um, obviously doing your work, right? But like yeah. also like, you know, being in a, an environment, any environment, even, you know, at the IFP, right? Being in any environment where people are encouraging of one another and they want to give back is is super important and 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 you know I've I've let, been able to to um to use the people I met by just having a good time and connecting and then and then talking about the work um seamlessly you know um as an extension of who you are because that's what it is as opposed to like the hard sell right so um, what has, uh, what's, what have you, um, what have been the highlights of your filmmaking since Cargo? So I had started an independent cinema in the Bahamas. Uh, really? and, and we had started a festival uh, at the Island House in Nassau. Oh. Um, after that, in, in terms of filmmaking, I, um, I'm working on a project right now that has gotten two grants from Sundance and we won the IDA grant in 2021. It's called Brigadi Bram and it's uh, a look at, um, uh, it's, it's the story of a painter. Uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away. It's a lot of, um, there's a lot of surprises in it and we've gotten a lot of support. And so we're in post um, on it now. Um, and and then I, um, uh, we, uh, so I had raised some money. Uh, we have a company. I have two other partners that are very lovely people, Trevit Willis and Julia Ch Woolley Chatwin. And we have, um, we're a production company where we're, we're doing our own productions. And uh, we are able to um, support in small amounts, um, independent films. And so we've done a couple of those. And so it's been really great to, to support other filmmakers, um, it brings us pleasure, and and we're also looking for support for other projects, but also giving back. Um, and then we had produced our own television series um, that that is probably going to come out um, sometime in the summer. Yeah, and so it's been a busy, busy time. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the television series? I, I just had a conversation yesterday with one of the one of my distribution partners about TV series and um, okay. whether it was a, a good move. I, I think that I find a lot of filmmakers that I meet who've never made a feature want to make a mm -hmm. series. And I, I always feel as though that's not the right direction. But once you've made some features, you know, no. so it sounds if that's been your trajectory as well. So I don't know anything about the television world. I think it functions very differently from the film world. Yeah. yeah. Um, I we made this um, we made this series in lockdown. We had some money in our company to to create it, um, and uh, it was a way. And our company just formed, and it was a way to to sort of do something and, and it was something that we could like make into we can connect the dots and make into a feature if we wanted to and so we had we had done it and we had finished post maybe last year at some time we do we do have an output for it i i, I can discuss that but right now because it's not i can't announce and that but um but yeah i i'm learning about it mm. but we we did it without we we did it without any expectations, you know, um, for the outcome. Like, you know, we, yeah. Do you mean That's, in a business? Study? So I don't know if, if I'm the best person to give advice <laughs> no, 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 like no, now, no. but maybe in a year from now, I can yeah, I'll have yeah, a better yeah, yeah. sense of it. I, I recently met some people at a film festival and um, they were, they had a production company very, uh, been around for a long time and they had made a television series, documentary series. And I said, oh, where, you know, where can I see it? And they said, uh, oh, we don't know how to sell it. So I actually have facilitated 
the sale of that series for them. And again, I too will be able to say in a year or so a bit more about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also it's hard for beginner filmmakers to be able to raise the kind of money that it would take to make a series. Yeah. And like the financing is different and it is a world I don't, I don't, it functions differently from film financing. And so, you know, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the the one that you got the Sundance grants for, that's a documentary, right? Yeah, a Sundance a Sandbox through Sandbox Films. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Brittany Bram and my co-director is Laura Gamzee. We're in the final stretch. Um, it's been a film that we've been working on for a decade. <laughs> so we have a decade of footage. Um, we we love our character. Um, so I, I I move between documentaries and narratives, and yeah, yeah. and we yeah we we just yeah I'm in love with the project, and yeah. So it's interesting also that when when you have a filmmaker who goes from documentaries to narratives, that's like documentary funding is you know the grants world and and that kind of thing yeah. the fiction is more the investor world and raising money that way so uh those those it's interesting that you do both of those it's it's different yeah like waiting for grants can be painful and you know it's procedural and and it takes a long time to hear back um you know we we and you have to keep the equity very small. Sometimes in documentary, you could take a little equity, but not too much, um, you know? Um, and so finding that balance uh, and figuring out what that balance is and what the market can bear. And, you know, it's been, you know, but also, you know, it's a labor of love, you know? Um, you, yeah, it's it's a sacrifice. Um, but there's not as much sacrifice as a person whose life we're making the film of, but. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I have another client who a client who has won a sandbox film grant and uh, I'm still not even sure exactly what what it all means but um, <laughs> but anything that gets to go through the Sundance pipeline you know is is always a, a top-notch film so congratulations yeah. on oh, that thank you thank you and then with your move to LA, um, is that a permanent move? Do you think, or no? No, this is temporary. This is temporary. Um, we have a couple of projects in the docket, um, and and just like seeing those through, and um, and then going from there and figuring out what the next move is. I'd like to be a person that can live all over the world. <laughs> I'm uh -huh. glad that my career has brought me to the point where I can be at different places. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. been fun being here. It's been fun to be. It's an electric city, and um, yeah, it's been it's been wonderful. Like I, I I I I'm so used to being in spaces when I announce I'm a filmmaker, and it's like so exciting. And now it's like, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody <else. laughs> and it's wonderful because you you feed off that and you feed off creativity. And I think. If it's not a filmmaker, I think other artists or other people that are moving forward and and thinking about ideas in new ways and 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 led by passion in any city is, or a town is is really is really encouraging um, to have because you feed off that you you know. Do you think yeah. that your next film will be um, in the Bahamas? No, my next film is not going to be in the Bahamas. Really? It'll be here okay. in the States. Yeah. Okay. It'll be a, a bit of a departure for me. Um, my next narrative is a horror film. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I love the genre. Um, you know, uh, I love the story that we have. And, and you know, it's a challenge for me. And, and it's a challenge for people to to as, as a as a filmmaker that's made socially conscious films it's uh it's it's a it's it's a way of people like you know obviously some people had a time making the adjustment but i think we i think it's a good film and i and i and i am a big fan of the genre and i've always loved the genre so i need well, to mm -hmm. add to it not that it has to be but a horror can also be a socially conscious film 
And this one is. <laughs> I'm not this surprised. I'm not yeah. surprised. You know, is. Um, I, I, w- I was talking yesterday with some of my clients about horror because I was never a, a horror fan at all. And yeah. there's a, a British um, journalist, film critic, I mean, called uh, Mark Commode. I don't know if you've ever come across him. I'll put his name in the chat. Um, yeah. And um, he has a PhD in horror. And I've been listening to Mark Mode now for years and years and years and years. And And, um, so I've learned about horror from him, you know, from somebody who has a PhD in horror and and who has a very sophisticated way about talking about horror. And I find even filmmakers um, really simplify the genre and don't really understand how 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 multifaceted it is as a as a genre there's any number of directions that you can go and um so you know i find filmmakers are often sort of defending themselves like well you know and i don't mean like a slasher horror film or whatever i'm like no that's like one slice one one part of it yeah 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 but certainly it's not not all horror films, you know, yeah. by yeah. so many. Yeah, I've always been a fan of it. I've had to watch it all, all by myself. I didn't have friends that would come with me to see them. But I, I yeah, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stop lying to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really was scared of horror films and, um, when I was about 17, my parents went out one night and they came home and found every single door open and every light on in the house because I'd been watching some scary movie and I got so scared. (laughs) (laughs) And then I stopped watching. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I opened all the doors and I got scared. I got too scared to watch uh, horror films for a long time. So um, let's see if anybody has any questions. uh, uh, Kareem is a great person to ask a question because he's done a lot of things. Does anybody have a question they want to ask? If not, Larry, go ahead. I've been very fascinated, Kareem, by what you've shared. It's really wonderful. I was, I was on IMDb checking out a lot of the films and seeing what you've done. It's really uh, my congratulations to you for a great career. Oh, I'm just kind of a. Uh, I'm not a full-time filmmaker. I, I'm focused on faith-based films right now, and I've done one feature. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thanks. I find myself an executive producer on a second film, and I have to raise $4 million. And it's it's daunting, uh, but it's an old Tolstoy uh, novella called The Death of Ivan Illich. We're just getting started. But the film's very well written by a uh, British screenwriter. And that's what really drew me. It's so well written. Uh, there's not even a lot of words in the film. There's probably 20% uh, uh, narration. And I think about 60% is visual. But I'm trying to figure out, I've never raised money uh, in the traditional way of a feature. So it's very daunting. And I just wanted to get your counsel of how you would go about it. Yeah, so... Like, so I'll tell you like how I'm approaching this new project, right? So so the projects that I've raised money for previously, like with all equity has been like below 1.5. So this project that I'm, I'm doing now is above that. And so what we're doing is that we are putting a, a we're putting one, one part of the piece, one, a piece of the puzzle is the equity. Um, uh, I think about twenty percent of it, and then we are looking to um to to finance tax credits as a piece of the puzzle, and then looking, and then we're also looking for distribution contracts that we can then finance. Um, so that's one way that we, like, I think when you start to get to, I there are definitely people out there that can like write a check for four million, like I was, <laughs> you know, um. Uh, but it becomes, you know, and even when you make faith, faith-based faith films, I, I think that's such a, a wonderful audience and a faithful audience that are just underserved and really hungry for content. 
Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could do it, do it in the equity way, but I would just, uh, but from, from my experience and, and there's many different ways to put the package together. So um, with this, with this film that's that's above two million, that's that's the method that we're going to use um, as, as taking a bit of the a, a bit of the equity, uh, going to a place where we can have some tax credits, and then looking for um, some distribution and pre sales uh, prior to to making the film that we can either like do um, like like get a loan for or a bridge loan or something like that for yeah and I, I'm, I'm happy to to One share i would say is that um there are people who can write a check for four million dollars but yeah there are there are. People who are going to write a check for four million dollars without any um clear idea about how they're going to get that money back uh, so I, I think it's a it's a fantasy to think that there are people who can who, who would write write a check for four million dollars without yeah. exactly what Kareem is talking about. Um, you know that that these are the ways that we're going to get this money back, and um, that there has to be all, all of those business pieces in place. Yeah, or a, or a plan and and how you want to structure. How you want to structure um like you know your your film is is kind of like a business and how you want to structure it and and how do you want to how, what your financing plan is going to look like and that differs um depending on the budget of the film um you know um yeah so i hope that was helpful i hope i, I also <laughs> think it's interesting when yes when, it was because, Filmmakers always say a number like four million dollars, and I always think, you know, and based on what? Yeah, we can make it for less, I'm sure. <laughs> well, because because often that number is made up, even even when um, people do their due diligence and hire a line producer. I mean, I I recently have met somebody who was going around for six years. Uh, trying to raise money for her first feature with a budget of $79 million put together oh, by a line producer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's insane. But somebody put that budget together. So what usually happens is people will say, well, the, the budget is $4 million. Based on what? I think one of the moves, and Kareem can uh, probably attest to this, if you can get an A-list actor on the front end, that really helps propel. So the budget probably is assuming that we're going to have, you know, in the lead role, an A-list actor, and which is not cheap. So how yeah. much is in the budget for that A-list actor? Who is that? So to me, once you start saying $4 million, I think that actually you're not talking about $4 million. You're talking about my movie with Jennifer Garner, my movie with such and such a name. Um, it then it's not about it's a four million dollar movie. It's a movie with so and so and so and so. By the way, I when I used to teach English at the University of Miami, I used to teach a course where the the ultimate uh, piece we read was the death of Ivan Ilyich. I I did a whole I did a whole semester of wow. in an English uh, class on death. <laughs> I I don't know it was something about being in Miami. I just thought you know. <laughs> I want to hear more about it. <laughs> I'm reading Anna Karenina right now just to kind of get a sense of Tolstoy. <laughs> yes, lovely to meet you. We'll talk yeah. soon. Does anybody else have a question? Because I'm gonna uh, I have more questions. So um. Uh, could you say a little bit about raising money for documentaries, Kareem? How how yeah. would you suggest somebody went about doing that? So, yeah, I I, I will I will bring I'll br I'll bring a project that we're working on now, right? Um, and then we at our company we've we've helped we've put in some equity into another documentary that's being made that that I'm not attached to as a just as a, a producer and in terms of like we are 
an entity that's giving some funding. So we, I think it's important for documentary filmmakers to like look at what the documentary is going to cost and then like what the market can bear. Like, I mean, sometimes the reality that I've recognized is sometimes like you would love to be that documentary that sells to a streamer for like millions and millions of dollars. Um, but when you think about all the documentaries that are being made, um, not everybody um, is as lucky. So what do you need to tell the best, um, the best possible story that you can, right? And there's tons of grants out there that are competitive, um, that are, are incredibly time consuming and uh, you just have to buckle up and, <laughs> and get it done. Um, and so, and then also, you know, if you align yourself with a, with a fiscal sponsor that can take, that people can give money that they can write off on their taxes is also a very important way to, to help fund a documentary, right? Um, as well, like, yeah. a, like, a, like a fiscal sponsor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then if you need to raise a little equity, um, you raise equity, be like, okay, I, I feel that our project is strong enough to return this equity that we're getting from this investor that wants our money back. And then you create like a waterfall and you say how the money's returned um, and you present that and you'd be like, well, this is the, this is the most um, equity that we're going to raise. And this is what we feel that the market can bear. And we feel like you can get a return on this. Um, um, and so sometimes the number is really, really small um, for a, for a film. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, so um, in the Bahamas, uh, where do you go to find a fiscal sponsor? I know a lot of my clients in Trinidad have this question. Well, you'd find one in the US. Aha, uh -huh, right, okay. Yeah. 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 Find, find a fiscal sponsor in the US and then raise money in the US. Um, and, uh, for, and, and I really like that, that model of raising some of the money through grants and the nonprofit kind of way, but then also putting in something with equity. But but you're saying it would probably be a small number. It, it would be whatever number that you that you feel that your film can recoup can on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously, some documentaries are more big ticket items, and you'd be like, of course, we could sell this for two million. Like you know what I mean? Or like you know, and so. If that's the case, then you do, or you'd be like, this is a very niche film about a niche community. And I'm talking about the film I'm doing now. I'm talking about a film that this other film that we are that we are, are partnering uh -huh. as a producer on. Not I'm not talking about Brigadier Bram. Like, like it's like um, it's like, you know, this is a very artistic film. We love it. I think it's really meaningful, but I don't know what this number is. But I know that we can sell it to this distributor and I know what they pay. Right. Uh -huh. um, and so let's put the equity, let's let's put this first piece of equity, let's let's cap it and what we think it can return on the marketplace. And sometimes people have a sales agent do that for them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's or 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 business person or and um yeah, so it depends on the project. Um yes. yes. You know. I, I have a client, we just submitted a grant in January. I keep talking about this because I think we're all traumatized, but we just submitted a grant in January for three and a half million dollars for a oh. documentary project. But yeah, yeah. Um, that we've been working on for a year and a half to get to that point where we could yeah. turn, you know, and- uh, Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That was that was work, you know, but- um, I think that you know documentary projects. Uh, people, I still hear people saying a lot, "Well, they don't make money," and it's just not correct. Uh, it's not no. true across the board. The same thing I was just saying about horror films. There's just too much variety, you know, out there in in what documentary films are are out there and what they can do financially. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's like with any, you know, I mean, there's a lot of documentaries we make. So 
So yeah. So if you think of it as a whole, <laughs> but yeah. you know, but there's some that really break through, and there's there's some there's there's many that break through every year, and there's different types of ways to present it, and you know, you gotta just figure yeah. out what your project is and know what your project is, and then make it accordingly to like how you think you can get it done that protects you and and your investors and yeah. And what would you uh, suggest for a filmmaker who's making their first feature film? What would what would be your advice? So my 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 best my best my best advice is to go out and do it. <laughs> you know, like like really, I I remember working on a on a on a big Hollywood film uh, at the shot in the Bahamas. I was a production secretary. And uh, I, I ended up getting fired, but that's another story. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I was, you know, starting out and, um, and I was just like, how are these people able to do it? And it was like, you know, they just went out and did it. Uh -huh. they just went out and did it. And, and, you know, they weren't exceptionally bright um, or exceptionally kind. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, there's a space for me to be my authentic self, to be kind, to treat people with respect, and to use my intellect to tell the stories that I want to tell. And so mm -hmm. I just have to go out there and do it. And that was the same sort of spirit that that kept me through film school, even though the I felt like the odds were against me to leave my country, to to go out and raise money, to believe in myself, to feel like I deserve it. You know, that your voice is important, that your audience is waiting for your story. For, for for your film whatever that film is because there's so many people in the world and I think more than any and then you will figure out that practical element of it and also listening to others and getting advice and finding a mentor yeah but it has to that's also important <laughs> but that it has to start from this not this arrogance not arrogance but this belief in in oneself that you're I think I think um, the saying, you know, the idea that my stories are important and my audience is waiting. And as I said, I'm seeing the 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 thing I'm most excited about right now is what I'm seeing is um, underrepresented film audiences are finding films that they want to see on AVOD right now, and and filmmakers are making money. Uh, especially um, filmmakers who are who are speaking to underrepresented audiences. That's that's what I'm seeing, and I find it very very exciting. Yeah. I don't know how long it'll last because the big boys will always step in. Uh, Dr. Demento, come and ask your question. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Kareem, uh, for being here <clears throat> and sharing uh, uh, your experience. Um, one of the questions, one of the things that I really liked that you just said was uh, the Stanley Kubrick comment, and that is just go out and make one. And I mean, that's so true. The, the first thing you're going to learn is all the things that you shouldn't have done, right? And so my real question uh, is related to this, and that is uh, when you do your films, do you normally have the typical amount of crew that's necessary, um, i.e. there's a list, let's say, of the people you're supposed to have. Um, do you do it that way or do you do it like the Dr. Demento way? And that is, I call it a gorilla crew. Everybody has multiple hats. Um, yeah. Your thoughts? So Dr. Demento, I've done it both ways. <laughs> so, uh, so the documentary we're making has narrative elements. And uh, so we did narrative elements, which is like, you know, bare bones. It looks great, <laughs> but of course no one's talking in it, but, uh, but, but I've done it both ways. And it depends on like what you need for the project to keep, you know, your, yourself safe and your crew safe and your actors safe. Um, yeah. uh, you know, first of all, um, but it, it it really depends on the story that you're telling and and what the requirements that you need. Like I've seen some really great films with with with, with minimal crew, you know. Um, and then you know, obviously, you know, in any film, 
like just talking filmmakers to filmmakers, you know, there's wastage that happens, right? It's just a part of, it's just a part of it. And you don't realize that you're there. You're like, well, you really didn't need that. Or, you know, or, and, but it's always so worse when it's like, wow, we really need this, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so finding that balance in between, but I, I have done, I've, I've, I've existed in both worlds. Um, you know, uh, sometimes like sometimes the bigger the crew, um, you can you can you can get really lost in it. But it is also like incredibly helpful. Or sometimes it can move a lot slower. That big org organism. Um, but sometimes it's really important to to keep people safe. Mm, that's pretty. Thank that's you. Important. I was going to say when you are doing when you are shooting all these films you've done on water. Um, how does that? How does a crew work then? Like if you have a, had a small boat, like in cargo. Yeah. What do you? Where does your crew fit? So we have two boats. So you have the picture boat and the camera boat, uh -huh. and and they're parallel to one another. And so everybody's the whole crew is on the camera boat, uh, and and the camera boat pulls up next to the picture boat. We all get off who, who's necessary, and we shoot. And the camera boat goes like somewhere where we not shooting where we can't see on uh, the horizon, and um, that's how we do it. And so it's a lot of you need a marine coordinator, uh, for sure. Yes. Uh, to help you with that, and and the thing about boats, I mean, I've done two films with boats. Uh, you know, one was a sailing movie, and the other one was cargo, obviously. And you can't tell boats what to do sometimes. Like they're just gonna. You know, you feel like it's going in a straight line, but it's really not. And <laughs> so you you have to you have to you know surrender. Marine coordinator, that's a, that's a new one on me. Yeah. I hadn't hadn't thought about that, but yes, that's great. Well, yeah. Kareem, thank you. Is, does anybody else have a question before we close up? Does anybody else have a question? Um, Kareem, thank you so much for coming uh, all the way from Los Angeles via the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, thank you. I, I, I am so happy to talk to you guys. I, I, I hope um, what I had to say was useful. <laughs> I'm still learning myself. Yes, so. of course. Um, no, it's, it's, it's so great. And the reason that I do these interviews is just to provide inspiration um, for filmmakers uh, to keep going uh, when it's always hard, <laughs> you know, it's always hard. Um, and congratulations on all of your new projects and can't wait to hear about the next one coming up and uh, yeah. have fun in LA. All right, thank you. Have a great, have a great rest of you guys this morning. Bye. I'll take care. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone.